Are you going to really go tell it on the mountain? I hear singing it. I pray we are going to do it. As we're going to see in scripture, sometimes people say things and really don't mean it. But I'm sure that don't mean that's not none of us. We're going to go tell it. First, giving honor to God, to Jesus the Christ who is my Lord and Savior. I, I, I feel blessed just saying that. Yeah. To the Holy Spirit, which is our seal and guarantee of the redemption of our mortal bodies. To my wife, Rosalind. To my fellow yokemen of the gospel. To all of our deacons and their spouse. To all of our servant leaders, our music ministry and our musicians and media ministry and ushers to all of the visitors in the house and to you the royal family of God known as the McKinney First Baptist Church and to our senior saints. Yes. Hallelujah. Can't wait to serve you in a little bit. Hopefully you're going to get two meals. We're going to give you a spiritual meal right now and then we'll give you some physical nourishment in a, in a minute. You would be so kind and turn with me to the book of the month. I wish I could just stop right there and everybody know what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But since I don't, I know that isn't the case, turn to, to the gospel of Matthew. We can stand as we're getting there. We're going to chapter 2. We're going to look at the part of the Matthew birth narrative. In Matthew chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to read to verse 12. Pray it's a very, very familiar passage. But here's the one thing I know about God's word. You cannot unearth all of the spiritual nuggets out of it. I don't care how often you read it or may have heard it. I'll be reading from the New King James translation. Verse 1 says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And we're going to use for a subject for this morning, Christmas, God's great enterprise of mercy. Christmas. God's great enterprise of mercy. You may be seated. Mighty and everlasting God. 
Lord, I come to you right now just desiring that you would breathe over every word, over every note that you have given me to share with your people. Father, if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak in me and through me, I am but giving a speech. Lord, I desire to be a vessel used by you right now. To share with those who are here today what you would have them to know about this great enterprise of mercy that we call Christmas. I pray, Father, that you would anoint me in your presence and saturate me in your spirit that I may share an uncompromised word on this day. I love you, I thank you, and I praise you. And I believe by faith your word is not going to go forward in vain it will accomplish what it was sent out to do in the matchless name of jesus the christ who i pray and give thanks amen ushers you may be seated in theological circles a man by the name of charles spurgeon he is affectionately known as the prince of preachers he was blessed to have more sermons published and archived than any other pastor who ever lived. Charles Spurgeon accurately described Christmas as God's great enterprise of mercy. Christmas is about God demonstrating to humanity mercy. The true meaning of Christmas is God's mercy, God's love, God providing the one and only way for us to spend eternity with him. Therefore, he gave his only begotten son to take our punishment for our sins. Jesus paid the price of sin in full. Every first Sunday, we, we hear the word to tell us that, which is a business term, which means when Jesus said those words, it is finished. It was he was saying, I have paid the price in full for every sin of the past, present and future. And we are free from condemnation when we accept his free gift of salvation Christmas was necessary because we needed a savior and God mercifully sent Jesus to save his people and to redeem his people we're now 10 days away from two of uh, from one of the two greatest miracles in the Bible Christmas of course being the first and Resurrection Sunday more often called Easter, the second great miracle. I would be remiss as a pastor to not speak specifically about what the Christian perspective should be regarding Christmas. I read an article regarding billionaire Howard Hughes, the late Howard Hughes anyway. Howard Hughes, if you don't know, was born actually in Dallas, Texas. And, and this article I read is so befitting to this time and season. Among the hundreds of businesses that Howard Hughes owned were six Las Vegas casinos. Places even Christians love to frequent this time of year. And I'm sure it's just to go eat the, the buffets, right? I know, I know. Got the best buffet in the world. Got to go to the casino to get it. Oh, Lord. Well, when Howard Hughes died in 1976, the article stated that the public relations director asked the casino managers for a moment of silence out of respect for Howard Hughes. The message went over the public address system of Howard Hughes's Las Vegas casinos and for a brief moment 
Even the noisy casinos fell silent. Housewives stood uncomfortably clutching their paper cups of coins at the slot machines. At the crap tables, stick men cradled the dice in the crooks of their wooden wands. Then a pit boss looked at his watch, leaned forward and whispered to the stick man, okay, roll the dice, he's had his minute. Some respect for Howard Hughes. Well, we're only about 10 days from Christmas. We've had an ice storm that took away an entire weekend of shopping in the stores. Notice I said in the stores, didn't say offline. So if we're not careful, we could be prone to give that same type of shallow respect to our Lord and Savior. We can get so caught up into rushing out to the shopping malls, caught up in mailing Christmas cards and decorating the house and entertaining guests that in the midst of it all, we rush off to church, sit through the service with our minds more focused on everything we have yet to, to get done. Oh, Lord. But one can say, well, the Lord got his minute. I at least went to church. My brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus is the reason for the season. He deserves to reign as Lord and Savior, not only on Christmas, but every day and every minute of every hour. We must make room for Jesus and make room for him this Christmas. So with my text as my guide. I'd like to share with you briefly three object lessons regarding the subject, Christmas, God's great enterprise of mercy. Object lesson number one, wise men still seek Jesus. Now, if my Girl Scouts was in here, they'd be giving me an amen right now. Wise men still seek Jesus. Let's walk through the text again. Verse 1 and 2 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now the wise men, you may have a little asterisk marked by the wise men in your Bible. If you've got a good study Bible. And you go and look over at what does it, it denote it in the Greek? It means magi. So when you hear people say wise men, magi, of course, they're speaking about the same thing. And contrary to one of the many traditional songs. Praise the Lord. I was hoping Brother Madison wasn't going to sing this today and he didn't. But contrary to one of the many traditional Christmas songs we've heard like we three kings of Orient are? Well, first of all, the wise men were not kings. And I know this is going to burst some of our bubbles, but the Bible does not state that it was just three men. What the Bible states is that they gave three gifts. Does not say it was three men and they were three kings. Almost every manger scene for Christmas that we see on TV at people's homes is biblically incorrect. Because there is no doubt based on this text, the wise men did not show up at the manger on the night of Christ's birth. But rather they showed up bare minimum several months, about seven months at bare minimum after that point, probably more like two to five years later. In verse 11, it says that Joseph and Mary were living in a house, meaning they were not at the animal stall where Jesus was born. Verses 7 through 11 refer to Jesus was a young child. If you notice how I read the, 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 the verses, when I put emphasis on verses, I'm really, you, you, you need to hone in on the fact I'm coming back to that. The text says young child. Nowhere does it say infant. 
And then Herod's edict was to kill all children two years and younger. So the major scene of three kings is not biblically correct. Now, if you have a manger scene at your house, or your neighbor do, don't go over there and tell them to take down, they stand, and you don't really have to take yours down. Because let me tell you something, just because you have three kings standing over baby Jesus, that doesn't put you in the line to go to heaven, nor does it take you out of the line and, put, and send you to hell. But, but, but my job as the pastor is to make certain we know what the word says, not what tradition says. Now, using the Bible as our source, the wise men or the magi could have come from Persia, which is present day Iran, because they were because there was a known prominent class of royal advisors in Persia who studied astronomy, astrology, science and religious matters. And in the book of Daniel, the word magi is used to refer to a class of men who interpreted dreams and divine messages of the king. And you can go back and look at this at your own, on, in your leisure in Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, chapter 2, verse 27, and chapter 5, verse 15. It is believed the wise men traveled some 900 miles searching for the young child Jesus. That meant they camped out all night. That meant they had to avoid wild animals. They had to put up with sleep deprivation. But it did not matter what they had to do or what they had to put up with. They were determined to seek Jesus no matter what. Well, for us, this Christmas season, parents are searching for the right toy. Searching for the right pair of shoes. Searching for the right coat, oftentimes because of peer pressure, their children or their child may experience because he or she does not have the latest in toy or the latest clothing item. And a reason many people are already stressed out with 10 days yet to go for Christmas is that they've forgotten that Christmas is not about us. It's not about Boxes and bowls. Christmas is all about Jesus the Christ. Remember the object lesson is wise people still seek Jesus. Psalm chapter 14 and verse 1 says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Now I'm not calling nobody who's not seeking God a fool. The Bible is. We are not wise in our own eyes just because we've graduated from University of Texas or UNT or Oklahoma or Grambling or Southern or Jackson State or Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary. What makes us wise in the eyes of God is that we fear the Lord. What makes us wise in God's eye is when we accept Jesus the Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're wise because we are obedient to God's word and his will for our life. Now the text introduces to some and presents to others king by the name of Herod. Herod's title of king of the Jews was granted to him by Rome, not by God. He was a pretender to the throne. Herod was not a part of the Davidic family line. As we've read Book of the Month, we get the genealogy of Jesus, and nowhere in there do we see Herod. Herod was a mean and cruel king, for he had several of his own children and at least one of his wives killed. Although claiming to be a God worshiper, he was a fake. He remained heavily involved in many forms of pagan worship. His only loyalty was to himself. Herod was a king placed in authority, but Jesus is a king born in authority. Church, I don't know what is really on your Christmas list, but I pray you are seeking Jesus like never before this year. I pray that each of us will seek to know our spiritual gift or gifts and ask God to stir up the gift that is inside of us that we may edify the church and glorify God. 
The McKinney First Baptist Church family, friends, visitors, the wisest man in the world was a man by the name of Solomon based on the Bible. Solomon came to this conclusion at the end of his life in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 8. Solomon said, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. You see, we must put God first over all we do and in all we do because without God, we have nothing. To have a savings without a savior is vanity. Knowing that life is futile without God should motivate the Christian to seek God first. Object lesson number two. When you find Jesus, you must worship him. I'm going to say that again. When you find Jesus, you've got to worship him. I'm still blown away. Although... I see it every week. I'm still blown away about how we can come in here, especially this time of year, knowing what the master has done, knowing that if, if we really believe Christmas is about Jesus, you can't come in here this time of the year. You can't come in here during the second major uh, uh, a miracle of resurrection Sunday. You just cannot be a Christian and not want to worship the master. You, you, it, it's just impossible to be Christian and not worship the master. Now, since Herod was a pretender to the king, verse 3 says he was troubled. You see, anytime you come to power illegitimately, you know you're going to have to try and defeat those who are the legitimate person for that position. And that is why, that is what Herod does in verse 4. If we look at verse 4 again, it says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And when it says all Jerusalem, the real emphasis here, it really means all the religious leaders of the city. And since Herod gathered the chief of the priests and the scribes, this was probably what, would be, what we would call an ad hoc meeting. Meaning it was not an official meeting of the entire Sanhedrin council because Herod was not on good terms with the Jewish court. Now you know that has to be some correlation to that to the church. See, this scenario exists in churches today. You see, when someone doesn't like the pastor, when somebody doesn't like their deacon, when somebody doesn't like their servant leader, they usually call only those people who they feel they can sway to their, their, their side and their position. Or they are, or they are people who are already subscribing to the venom that is being falsely and erroneously spread. See, there's only certain folk that you know you can call. And, and when you got nests to share, they waiting on it. Girl, did you know what happened? Did you see him with that? Yeah, there's a group. See, see, see that Herod, he knew I could call on a, spe a specific group of these folk that were going to fall in line with me. Because he had some crumbs he was going to give them off of his table. See, I'm going to say this out loud. You can't buy Pastor Louis Rosenthal. I'm going to say what God give me to say every Sunday. I'm going to deliver the mail to the mailboxes God give me. Now, you can take it and throw it away, but I'm going to deliver it the way God give it to me to where it's supposed to go. Now, if you look at verses 5 and 6, let's, let's, let's look closely at those verses. It says, So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah? For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, this verse or these verses reflect that these people had head knowledge but no heart transformation. 
The chief priests and the scribes, they were very accurate in quoting the messianic prophecy from the prophet Micah because what they're reading is in italics. Again, you got one of the good study Bibles. It will show you that this is coming from Micah, one of the minor prophets, minor only in the amount that was written, not in what he wrote. But the minor prophet Micah wrote this in, in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. So Jesus coming on the scene, it's not like God all of a sudden was scratching his head and saying, now what am I going to do? Because these folk acting up. Before the foundations of the earth, God knew already once he gave man free will that man was going to see it. Therefore, he already had the plan already in place. And if you go and look at Galatians, it talks about in the fullness of time. Well, now is the time that was full for Jesus to come on the scene. The chief priests, they accurately described what was going on, but they but they didn't recognize the Messiah was right before. They were five miles away from where the Messiah was born, and yet they did not recognize him. And the reason was because they were looking for a warring king, looking for somebody to come and defeat the Romans. They were looking for somebody to come and put them in charge. They were not looking for a suffering, a suffering king. But yet if they would have followed the same, have followed the word of God, they would have seen that the prophets of old foretold of Jesus. He was going to be bruised. Now, the wise men were seeking the king. The Jewish priests and scribes were ignoring the king. And then Herod was opposing the king. Now examine with me verses 7 and 8. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them when the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the, look at the verse again, young child. Notice it didn't say infant, didn't say baby. Carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring, him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now, Herod had evil ulterior motives. Secretly, he called the wise men to discover exactly where they first saw the star. Because knowing the precise time that the star uh, appeared allows Herod to calculate the time of the birth of Jesus. And then he could make plans for his futile uh, effort and attempt to eliminate the threat called Jesus. Herod, of course, was lying when he said that he found that once they found the young child, he too wanted to worship him. Yeah, this type of thing happens all the time in church on Sundays, too. People say with their lips that they love the Lord and want to worship and want to worship him. Yet they don't crack the Bible open during the week. I wonder if a poll could be taken right now. How many people have cracked the Bible open since last Sunday we were here to today? I believe in my spirit. Maybe it's the ones that are just not here. But there are some who might not have even opened up the Bible. It is impossible being Christian and not in this word. It is impossible being Christian and not in prayer. It is impossible to be one who is that. Now, let me let me backtrack to say there are times when we are Christians, when we're going through trials and storms that Satan draws away for a season. But it's a season. It's not a lifestyle because God is going to use circumstances, trials and whatever to speak to us, to draw us back, to get us back to the basics. Now, if you look at verse verse nine. It says, when they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child. Again, everywhere in this text, it says child. Never does it say infant or baby. The star was probably a supernatural phenomenon, perhaps like the pillar of fire that guided the Jewish people in the wilderness. This, this wasn't no ordinary star. 
There, there, are, uh, there, there are scientists that come out and said, well, Jupiter and Saturn align themselves in such a way that it made such a bright light. I, there's nothing in scripture that's, that, that, I, that, that states this that I can go and find, but I can find in scripture where God supernaturally created the pillar of fire and the, and the, and the cloud that he used to, for his people Israel. If I'm not mistaken, I think you go in Genesis and you find God spoke and stuff came into existence. So I don't think God created a special star to guide these stargazers is something that is beyond what God could do. The wise men responded to the light God gave them by seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. They were clear in their purpose from the onset. Because in verse 2 it says, we have come to Worship him. That should be the motto. That should be what we're about every Sunday when we come here. When you get to the parking lot, I'm talking about if you're ready to come do what God called you to do. When you get out of your car, you need to be focused on worshiping the Lord. See, Satan used somebody's sweet potatoes didn't come out right. Uh, uh, somebody's uh, steak wasn't cooked just right. They got some folk came to church today all out of walk because their food might not be perfect. But the primary reason I'm here today and I pray you are here today is to worship our true and our living God. And if your cake fail, that's all right. I'm going to eat it just like it is. So often, Satan can get us caught up with stuff that has nothing to do with kingdom advancement, yet we spend so much time and effort getting caught off in things that just detract us versus bring us closer to him. Now, whether they were absolutely clear in, in, in of his divine nature, speaking of the wise men or not, we really don't know. But we do know that the words of the wise men and their actions point to more than them just giving homage uh, that they would pay to an earthly king. Because they gave no such worship to Herod. They must have at least known that this child king was the one Daniel described in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 through 14. Let me read those verses to you real quick. In Daniel 7, 13 through 14, it says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming from the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all peoples and nations languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom the one which uh, 